everybody, and welcome to uh, our Etch Etchel's West Coast Spring Series webinar. I'm your host, Alex Curtis. I'm located in uh, Newport Beach, California. I'm joined by Eric Doyle. Eric, uh, where are you and uh, what's going on? Hey, Alex. How you doing? Good. I'm in the beautiful, used to be quite white, North Minnesota. It's quite nice today. 50 degrees. Everything's melting. Ice nice. is melting. My ice boat's going to be put away for the winter, I think. Nice. Well, your stars uh, trophies, no matter where you are, they look magnificent in the background. Eric's fresh off of his second place at the Bacardi Cup. And, um, you know, yeah. um, to miss the first event down in San Diego uh, last week, but it sounded, you know, extra sporty with one day of sailing in South Bay because it was too windy to sail out in the ocean and then kind of normal San Diego conditions um, on Sunday. So uh, today we're gonna be focusing on sailing on the Coronado Roads course. Um, and we're gonna specifically be talking about how to trim the jib uh, and this new Australian sails. And you know, for our guys and our local fleet, this is a relatively new concept after you know, sailing for years and years with the traditional San Diego sails the way we tune the boats and the way that we um, trim the sails are slightly different. And so that's where our focus today is gonna be on the four triangle. So Eric, there's a lot of different variables up there. I mean, I look underneath the cabin housing of an Etchells and I have no idea what's going on most of the time. So uh, why don't you walk us through, what are, what are the basics on how guys can get their four triangle all set up and simplified and just sort of walk us through your thought process. Yeah, the jib is uh, super critical on the etchels, as we all know. You know, once we get our basic rake and, and mass bud and shroud settings all correct, you know, in, in where we want them, you know, the, the most important thing, like you said, is, is getting the jib set correctly in the four triangle. So everything needs to be set up where it's super accurate, very easy to repeat the settings okay and uh it starts with the jib halyard okay the jib halyard needs to be it, it can't I, i've gotten on some boats and it's gone to like a cleat and you know the guy's cleated on just a regular park and cam cleat or something like that and i'm like that that's not gonna work and they're like well i've got a mark on it well when the guy's taking the spinnaker down and you know he's trying to get the jib up and you know all hell's breaking loose at the lured mark and the back stays not on and stuff like that it, it, it's very hard to get it at the at the right mark so you know it either need you know your boat either needs to have a horn with a with a loop on the halyard so you loop it over the horn it's in the same spot and then you can adjust it with a fine tune or even i know vince you know he recommends going fully old school and, and using a wire for the backstay with a ball swedge on it and put that on there. And he wants no stretch at all coming from the, from the jib halyard. You know, he's, he's a big fan of that. You know, there's some really super low stretch line nowadays, SK 99 at, at the bare minimum, you know, even the 78 isn't that good, you know? So we can't have any creep, we can't have any stretch. Obviously if the halyard stretches and it's down, it's, it's effectively, lowering the whole jib and and moving the lead aft if you know and vice versa if you're if the you get it too high or you know then it's effectively moving the lead forward and you got to ease the sheet and it kind of gets out of whack okay so we need to get the halyard very in a very repeatable good spot we like the jib tack like in this picture to be about an inch and a half two inches off the deck okay so that leaves us a little range we're going up the first bead and we get the big puff comes on. We got to be able to trim it down a little bit. It doesn't bottom out, you know, and likewise, if we get a puff, if we get a big lull, you know, we need to ease it a little bit. Easing it helps make the jib fuller. It helps power up the boat. You know, we like to see those little wrinkles uh, in the luff, not too much more when it's lighter, but when it's windy, you know, we want them to be, you know, almost, gone not totally until it gets really windy um you know when when i sail the boat if i drive the boat forward crew is in charge of the luff tension of the jib you know they usually have the tack right up on the cuddy cabin on the side and and i tell them they've got the green light to adjust that 
basically as much as they want. And uh, if I could do that on my star, I wouldn't. My star, I've got it on the side where I can control it. And most of the time in an etchels, I come out of attack and, and I want the guy to ease it because we're trying to get the boat up to speed. It's a big, heavy boat. You know, we want the jib to be full. Like I said, unless it's really windy and really flat water, we, we want to power it up a little bit. And a lot of times in San Diego, we're, we're easing that quite a bit. We get some waves. We want to, it just physically makes the whole jib fuller, makes it the sail a little straighter in the front. You know, when we, when we struggle with the, with the flat water and pointing, we, you know, we're going to pull that on a little bit, you know, to, to round it up and open the groove. But that's a very, very critical uh, part of trimming the jib is very repeatable on where the halyard, where the head of the sail ends up every time. Yeah, all really great points. And, you know, if, if someone were to just take away one thing from that, it's, you know, be aggressive with the jib tack. And if you ever feel like you're just searching for power, or maybe you have three guys up on the rail and one guy kind of, you know, tits on the deck, if you can just ease the jib tack a little bit to get everybody up on the rail. You know, that, that's what we're always looking to do in San Diego is we're trying to get guys hiking. Guy, if we're sailing in San Diego and you're trucking out to the right-hand side and one guy's hiking and one guy's uh, got bodies in the boat, the guy who's hiking is going to win 10 times out of 10. So that, that's all really important stuff. A new part of this uh, whole Australian jibs, whether you have the MAL or the LM6R, is now our sheeting angles have been reduced quite substantially. I think a lot of times we're now sailing at seven or eight degrees uh, of sheeting angle. And there's a bunch of different ways to skin the cat um, in terms of what you're using, whether it be a dog track, which I know Eric has uh, used in the past, or my team with Argyle, we use a floating lead. I call it like a TP52 style type lead where there's a up down adjustment and an in out adjustment. Um, you know, in reality, what, what are we trying to achieve well, how do we know when we've come inboard too much and, you know, to kind of walk us through the thought process of getting the lead set up, you know, from the start of the day when you're kind of tuning up. Yeah, basically, you know, all the boats used to have tracks that were outside of the little cuddy cabin that the Etchells have. And, uh, you know, some really smart guys started figuring out, you know, hey, this is quite a wide angle. So why don't we start trimming inboard more? You know, it just, it makes sense. There's, you know, we, we, we see some of the other boats out there racing and Grand Prix boats and you can barely step between the mast and the jib. They're sheeted in so tight. You know, those boats are quite low drag. Uh, they've got quite stiff masts and, and low leeway, but it works to a certain extent on an Etchels too. It is, is definitely helping a lot. Uh, kind of found that, you know, 50 mils inboard is, is pretty safe, you know, from the edge of the cutty cabin. And we can go as far in as like 70 mils, which is reducing it even more. Um, you know, <clears throat> the rougher the water, the more careful you have to be on how hard you in you inhaul uh, and how hard you sheet. Uh, in the flatter water, we're gonna we're gonna go in uh, all the way max. You know, and to be honest, I, I haven't sailed the boat in a lot of wind with the new in-hauling system. We haven't made any, you know, we haven't had any big weekends in Miami, and I wasn't in San Diego last weekend. I've been to San Francisco. So, you know, the 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 limit, you know, on how far we go when it's really windy, I I, I just don't know. I, I haven't I haven't sailed it that much, you know. It's it's interesting, like in the in the star boat, we sail in quite a lot of wind at times, and the, the jib is backwinding the main and it's starting to turn inside out. And we've tried dropping the lead, and it doesn't really seem to do a whole lot of a lot of help because we got to remember when it's when it's light air, we're just getting up on the rail and hiking. The main does 75-80% of the work, and the jib does about 30-35%. Once it gets really windy, the main's really basically just flipping us over. So we're making it as flat as we can, and we're just using it kind of as a trim tab on the back of the sail plant to balance the boat out. And the drive switches. It switches from the main being the primary force to the jib doing, you know, 75, 80% of the, of the driving force of the boat. Uh, so, 
you know, learning just how far inboard you can go in that condition, I think it'd be really important, you know, because a lot of times it gets very big waves when it's windy and we got to figure out, you know, just how. So I'm, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on that because I haven't sailed in it so much. But, you know, we still want to keep the jib, you know, pretty, pretty powered up and going in the breeze because it's a big, heavy boat. It's got a lot of surface, wetted surface area and we want to keep it going. And we, if we make the jib, if we depower it too much, there won't be any punch, won't be any drive to get through the waves, you know. So, you know, if you have the dog tracks, very important to have marks on the deck. You know, we have that 70 mil max and then we're kind of 20 mils from out of that. And, you know, so that way when we, you know, sag the force day more, we, we know that we got to go outboard. We know we got to go outboard more, body's low and we've really got everything eased. And uh, the, again, the repeatability and the marks on the deck and that we know where we are is super important. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy to get lost in the etchels and especially, with, yeah. like you said, it's, it's just, there's stuff changing constantly. And we're, you know, when we first started down this rabbit hole, we, we were really bad and we were changing everything all the time. And we've, like to think that we've gotten a little bit quicker and things are just more simple now you start to find some small ranges that might work for you and you know start there and then build upon that and um but you know we always talk about change one isolated variable at a time <clears throat> to, and then pay attention you know sort of scientifically to how does the boat react um that comes to you know our our lead position it, Eric already kind of touched on it, but in general, when bodies are in the boat, you know, we want the lead to be further outboard. When we start to get guys hiking, we want the lead to come inboard. Um, so, you know, this is Tom and his team that have put in an absorbent amount of effort, um, you know, through the COVID period into this year down in Miami, they got boats everywhere, coaches, you know, they're putting in an excellent effort. And I know, Eric, you really like this picture. So why do you like it so much? What does it kind of tell you about the balance of the boat? Yeah, this looks like another beautiful day in San Diego. I may have actually taken this photo. You know, typical, you know, 10, 12, 13 knot picture in the breeze with uh, the boat nicely balanced. It's got perfect heel. It's got just enough. And you can see that the leeward side of the boom is right on the center line. So that's low drag. And we can see just a little bit of rudder angle. See how the tiller is pointed just to weather a little bit. So that means that there's a little angle in the rudder and the rudder is helping to generate lift. It's not too much drag. If you're pulling any more than that, that would be, you know, just straight drag and slowing you down. Um, they're, they're, you know, just starting to hike really hard. The jib is max inhauled. And if we look at the leech profile of both the main and the jib, you know, they really, they really match nicely. You know, that's hard to tell from on the boat. You know, you, it's kind of a feel thing, but everything about that right there just looks really right to me from the heel angle, from the boom position, from the, the, the exit angle of both sails. You know, you can see his, his lowered shroud looks just snug. Maybe the lower dangling just a little bit, but it's just the boat is just nicely in balance, and the boat should be doing the work along. And it's and it's very pretty pretty flat there. You know, we don't see a whole lot of waves, so that's going to be max pointing condition. This is a condition where the you just really it's tough to not have in haulers because you are pointing a little a little bit higher all the time, and eventually you know, it's going to pay off. I'm not saying you, you, you're not gonna be able to win without them, but it's a lot more work, believe me. Yeah. And so, you know, to build upon that, a lot of the lead position is relative to the force they sag. And for so many years in San Diego, we, we, we were used to the LM2L where when you got bodies in the boat, you're trying to sag the head, stay really search for power to the point where the rig was like shaking. And, uh, you know, sometimes the, you had so much force they sag that you sailed towards the pull on the back stay to stabilize the boat. Well, you know, the MAL and the LM6R and the LM6R specifically need to sail with a much firmer head stay. But you still are looking, specifically the MAL can handle a little bit of force stay sag 
when everybody's in the boat, but you just have to know that when you sag the forestay, you need to move the lead outboard. The two of them work congruently with one another. As the forestay gets firmer, like Eric alluded to in the last slide, you can get aggressive about bringing the inhaul all the way into that seven and a half, eight degrees of sheeting angle. When you start sagging the forestay and you're searching for power, the sheeting angle might be more like nine or 10. Um, so Eric, why don't you talk a little bit about that? What is how can you tell when you're sailing with too much force they say? Yeah, I guess, you know, we sell two downrange jibs, you know, one's a radial jib, the LM6R, and then and then the MAL, which uh, a lot of people have had success, success with as well. Now the MAL slide flies slightly flatter. And for that reason, and, and it has a little more luff hollow, so you can sag the force day more and, and have a little more range with that sail. Uh, so when we sag the four stay, we, you know, we make the sail a little fuller. The LM6R is a little bit, flies a little bit fuller, has a little more power overall. And we're not, we don't need to be quite as aggressive uh, sagging the four stay in the, in the light air because it's, it's got the power. You know, if we sag the four stay too much on the LM6R, it gets quite knuckly and draft forward and it gets, and the boat gets kind of cranky. It's hard to sail to it. And that's when we, you know, we leave the, we leave the shrouds a little bit tighter, you know, maybe keep the backstay on just a touch, you know, just past snug. And I really like that because the force, it doesn't bounce as much. It's harder. It's easier to drive though. It's harder when the force stays bouncing around, you kind of got to control it a little more, but in the flat water, you know, there's basically different ways to skin a cat and, and to, to get the power out of the mouth, sag the force stay a little more aggressively lead goes outboard. LM6R, you kind of leave it alone. You just adjust the sheet a little more and play the tack. And the, and the lead, you know, it's not going to go as far outboard as the mal. It's going to stay in about 50 or, you know, 45 mils or something like that. Just think of small increments, everybody. You know, don't, don't go crazy and, you know, move it two inches in every puff or something like that. It's, it's rare. To, we, gotta, we have to do that. And that makes it pretty hard on figuring out exactly you know, how the boat's going and how high and did we get a shift or we're just pointing lower because we've moved the lead so far outboard. But, but you know, this is, if, if we look at these pictures, the one on the left, we're straight on and we see that the four stay is relatively, you know, firm compared to how we used to sail the boats. You know, we used to sail the boats. If you look at the picture on the right, we're not straight on, but we used, that's how they used to look at all the time. We would look at the pictures from the front and there'd be, you know, 10 or you know, eight or 10 inches of four stay sag. And now we're, we're, you know, we're down to four to six or something like that. Yeah. And especially in the first, you know, couple races of the day, probably the entire first race in San Diego and maybe the first leg of the second race, you know, where you're searching for power, you don't quite, the breeze hasn't filled in. This is kind of the boat on the left specifically because we're straight on. That's the kind of the look that you're kind of, kind yeah. of going for. Yeah, that looks really nice. So, uh, and then, you know, a, another big part of repeatability is spreader marks. You know, we're, especially the jib trimmer needs to get feedback from the helm and the main trimmer because they can't really see the spreader marks uh, from where they sit, but everybody needs to know where the leech is relative to the marks. And, you know, at the bottom of this slide here, this is our tuning guide recommendation of where you should have the marks. And that is one foot six and a, and a quarter inches should be the inside one. And then one foot and nine and three quarters of the inch, inches should be the outside one. And on our boat, we actually have one just inside um, the, the inner one. And we put a red piece of tape on there. We know that, that it's about, we, we move it, I think it's like a two inches to the left or three inches to the left. And that's our red line thing. So if the boat feels really good. We're on rails, we're going fast, and we think that we can pull a little bit of, a little bit more sheet on and maybe a little bit, the whole thing a little bit further inboard. That's sort of our red line that we've- Red done. line in it, man. Max RPMs, huh? Yeah, just terminal velocity. The boat just <laughs> starts foiling. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Getting close. But, uh, yeah. So, you know, talk about when, when do you want flow? When do you want twist? You know, when do you want straight leech? And how do you use the spreader marks, you know, as a tool? Yeah. Another nice picture here. This looks like uh, Chris Bush sailing upwind. Beautiful San Diego. They're, they're headed, uh, you know, headed toward the, 
toward the point there, kind of inside the jetty. And we can see looking up on the spreader, we can just barely see the marks, kind of like the front of the jib at the spreader is at the outside mark and the, and the dark shadowed part is at the inside of the mark because they've gotten kind of inside the point so that the waves are a little softer there. They're not, they're not too dramatic. So they're, they're, it's flat water. They're trying to point hard. They're just starting to hike. You know, they're not fully hiked out, but the traveler's not way up. So this is max pointing condition right here. If we, if we look down, we can see how far in the clue is from the Cuddy cabin. And the leech of the jib matches that and the force stays pretty firm too. So, you know, definitely when we, we can just start, this is a condition where we just start to stall the telltale pretty hard. You know, and you can see his top telltale is just stalling the red, just above the, the, the shadow on the jib. You know, it pretty much if it gets lighter than this, we, we need to have flow 80, 90% of the time. And when there's people in the boat, you know, and we're, we're not at the inside mark on the leech, we're in the middle or with the outside mark, we need to have flow 100% of the time, 100%. Once it gets, you know, really breezy, it's, it's hard to shut down the jib. But let's think about it that way. If the, you know, we're, we're looking for power, we've got people in the boat or low side, we're going to try and make the jib really full and it's got to have max flow all the time. Boat wants power. It's big, heavy, fat boat, right? It needs power. And we're not going to really, to get the boat to move, go fast enough, we're not really worried so much about pointing, right? So everything's eased. The traveler's up. You know, the sheet is eased. We've got max flow on the main. We've got max flow on the jib. Body starts sliding in the boat. As the boat starts to heel over, we're trying to get to max power. We want to get everybody on the rail as fast as we can. We want to get to max power. We want to use all that riding moment. You know, we don't want to be all relaxed like, like Patrick is right there, but you know, he relaxes all the time, but we, you know, every now and then I see him hike. And so then we can start trimming in. And the other thing to remember skippers is the telltale window in the main is really, you have the best view looking, you know, that angle you look from behind, you are looking straight at the leech and you have a really good view of seeing where that leeches in relation to the marks on the spreader the middle guy can see it okay the front guy who trims a jib it's really hard for him to see it so you know when i come out of attack you know the, the crew has a pretty good idea where the jib clue is and how far apart it should be but it's got to be flowing we've got a full flow out of the tack the main's a little ease the jib's a little ease and then a lot of times when it's windy you can feel the boat is kind of waiting 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 and then it kind of rocks over on its side and that's the sign that you've, you've stopped the speed drop, the speed's accelerating, the boats, the foils have got full flow and the boat's starting to go. And that's when you say, okay, let's go. And we trim. And then we trim like Alex has at the, at the inboard mark. And a lot of times if I feel good and the boat's very responsive and it's going well and it's flat, you know, I'll say, hey, trim an extra two clicks, you know, and the trimmer can get that extra little bit. You get to that red line mark and the boat's real happy there. And you got to be careful, you know, if you get some waves or you get a lull or something, we want to really just look at that jib and make sure we ease it out a little bit. We keep pressing on the boat to keep it going fast because it's a double whammy if you go slow, right? Because you've slowed down already. So there's all that time you're slowing down and then you got to speed back up and it takes a long time for the boat to accelerate. So that's what we really want to avoid. And we'd rather be caught going just a touch fast all the time than stopping the boat and having to re-accelerate all the time. Yeah, and I sail with a really talented jib trimmer, Mark Ivy, and Mark is, will be the first one to admit that there's so much going on in the front of the boat. Like, it's important for the whole team to be a part of the jib trim conversation. So, you know, as, me as the tactician and as the main trimmer, I'm constantly out of tacks, you know, making sure the jib's coming in all the way, that the cloth isn't too tight. So he's jumping in the boat, tacking, jiving, moving the leads, softening, worried about battens, you know, all sorts of different stuff. So it's really trimming the jib is a total team effort. And um, definitely the spreader window is an underutilized tool, I feel like, among our little fleet in San Diego. Because sometimes, you know, we'll take pictures from the coach boat and the jib is way too tight or way too easy. So, you know, like Eric said, just really pay attention to those uh, spreader marks, because that'll tell you a lot about where you are in your trim. Um, 
at this point, uh, we're kind of winding down to the end. So if anybody has any questions, now's the time to fire it in the chat and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Uh, Eric, okay, so typically, you know, the second beat of the second race through the end of the day is when, you know, the breeze starts to come up, the nice northwesterly comes in, you start to get this sort of cloud look over Point Loma, and, you know, we're off. This is when, you know, Chamber of Commerce, San Diego, barely getting splashed, it's beautiful, you just start to hike. What what are we looking at? What, how do we reduce the amount of drag <laughs> profile, and what are, you know, obviously we pulled the tack down, we're winding on the rig, but how do we kind of take that next step to now we're hiking and what should we be looking for? Yeah, so, yep, like you said, Chamber of Commerce, San Diego Day, wind comes in, you know, the Etchell, it's a big bow, but has a massive sail plan too, really big, tall rig, heels over quickly, you know, we're up to max power at uh, eight, nine, 10 knots of wind, okay? So we've gone to having the traveler way up and then and the jib kind of eased, and now we've, we're, we're trimming the main really hard. You know, the sail has started to stretch a little bit. The boat's healing over. We've got everybody max hike. That's a big deal. Hike hard. You know, San Diego is a place where you, you, you hike a lot because there's just enough wind to power the boat up. And you, you don't want to over tighten things because if you get caught with the rig too tight, then the sails are too flat and you don't have enough power and you don't want that. So you, you need to set the boat up for the lulls, we need to set the rig tune up for the, the lulls because that's when we let the back stay off a little bit, we ease the jib tack, we pull the traveler up, we twist the sails a little bit, and then the boat's going perfect. And then in the big puffs, you know, we kind of do the opposite, but we were, there are times we really want the rig a lot tighter. And so we just got to hike through the puffs as hard as we can, you know, we just the outhaul a little bit, and then if we're if we're max hiked all the time and we're having to ease the traveler below center line to keep the boat on its feet, to keep the boat from healed too much, from keeping this the helm just right, then it's like, and we've got the back stay on all the way, and we can't trim the main in, we can't keep the boat on its feet. Okay, it's probably time to start going up on the rig tension, you know. We we've hopefully we've raced this boat before a couple times, or we've just kind of go by the tuning guide depending on your turnbuckles, you know, what your ratio is from your uppers to your lowers. Normally when it's lighter, you've got a little bit of side sag in the mast. So you're for every, you know, X number of turns you're going on the caps, you're going maybe double that on the lowers, you know, so it's a one to two, one to three, maybe even a one to four ratio, depending on how soft your mast is. But we'll go on from having side sag in the mast to the mast getting straighter and straighter and straighter. You know, it's as the wind picks up, I encourage everybody on practice days to, you know, go forward and look up your mass to make sure that you understand what, you know, one turn on the caps and three turns on the lowers does to your mast. Does it get rid of all the side bend? Does it, does it make the mass poke to weather? You know, is it one and three? Is it one and two? Is it one and four? And then you go another two and four. It's generally how we've, we've, we've gone with the mass that we had in, uh, in Miami. It's quite soft sideways. And for every one turn on the caps, we were going four on the lowers. And that'll, that'll help you tighten the four stay. That'll help keep the mast in column. That'll help when you pull the back stay on, that the mast doesn't overbend and you get those huge overbend wrinkles. So those are the, those are the telltale signs. But, you know, like I said, we hike a lot in San Diego because the wind goes up and down and we don't want the boat to be underpowered in the lulls. We want to have enough power that the, that we still have everybody hiking. And then when it's windy, we're kind of hanging on in the puffs and, you know, pulling more backstay. We, you know, we have a nice range, you know, that we can let the backstay off to power the boat up in the lulls. And we pull it on in the puffs so that we're not too bound up and the boat can run and we can keep the bow down and we're not sailing inside the jib all the time. Yeah, keeping the bow down, hiking hard. Yeah. It's, it's that's what it's all about. Like that's I said, that's the key in San Diego. Yeah. If one guy has a guy that's fully hiking, when the other boat is guys in the in the boat, the guy that's hiking is going to win ten out of ten times. Yeah, yeah. You got bodies on the boat. You know what makes the boat go is riding moment. You got to use the riding moment. You got to be hiking hard. So, you know, the next regatta for the San Diego crowd is the Billy Bennett Cup, uh, which is, I believe, March 25th and 26th, 27th weekend, something like that. 
And then we have the Etchell's uh, Midwinters West, which is the 8th through the 10th of April. And then uh, we will have our next webinar on April 18th at the same exact time. Um, and the topics for then is, you know, we'll probably go over some of the regattas and if people, you know, people should use what we talked about here and go and try to apply them, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks and feel free to reach out to both to either of us uh, with any questions that you may have. And uh, until then, we hope to see you guys around and hope to hope to see you by the hoist. So Eric, stay groovy up there in uh, Minnesota. and We'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Thanks, Alex. Email us your questions if you got any people.